Joining us now is one of those Democrats, the Congresswoman-elect, Marie Glusenkamp Perez from Washington's 3rd Congressional District. Congresswoman-elect, congratulations. Thank you for being with us tonight. Were you surprised? I was here in this very room with uh, Steve Kornacki when we, we called the race for you, and it was described as an upset. It was, uh, it was an unexpected win. Was it unexpected to you? I, I would not describe it as unexpected. I, I know the district. I, you know, I live here. I'm, I'm a fifth-generation Washingtonian. And this is a district that has a proud history of sending independence to Congress. I mean, one thing I would challenge is that, you know, in, in our, our data actually shows that many, many Democrats actually voted in the primary with Jamie Herrera Butler to support her um, impeachment vote. I, I underperformed, actually, in the primary substantially, because in our district, we have many Americans who are standing up for the middle of the road. That's, that's what we're known for in southwest Washington. And that's part of what made Joe Kent's ascendancy so improbable and so miscalculated. So this is interesting. When you say you sort of underperformed and a lot of Democrats uh, voted for Jeremy uh, Herrera Butler, your path to victory, which that, that uh, article that I just quoted from describes, it's kind of like an escape room. You had lots of little clues to tell you how to, how to campaign and how to succeed. So when you say you're not surprised, it's on the basis of a bunch of little things that you saw, that Joe Kent was improbable, that, uh, that Jamie Herrera Butler did appeal to independents and some Democrats, and that you knew that the issues that you would campaign on would be appealing to your constituents. That's right. I mean, I think we're all hungry for a Congress that looks more like America, for people that want to fix things in our country, build bridges, not burn them down. You know, and, uh, you know, I, I really respect the principled stance Congressman Herrera Butler took in, in her vote. And, um, you know, I got in this race to stand up against the political extremes. And, and that's why I'm so proud to have seen the district. You know, we, we were outspent actually 40 to 1 in the primary. That's part of part of the equation here. In the general, so many moderate Republicans, so many independents, and so many Democrats really got behind us and propelled us to the front of this race. I, I know you didn't mean it as a cliche when you say that people want people who fix things. You actually fix things. This is actually your That's job. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we, you know, we're an independent auto shop. Um, we fix cars. We fix the cars of middle America, people who are just trying to get to work, whose catalytic converters have been stolen, whose emergency funds are going to be wiped out by petty crime. I mean, this is what, you know, frankly, a lot of America looks like right now. So you didn't delve into, obviously, you had an opponent who was a, a, a bit of a conspiracy theorist, more than a bit, and an election denier. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things that, that um, Republicans used against Democrats in this past election, two things, really, the inflation issue and, uh, and, and, and culture wars. You, you know one of them very well. Obviously, inflation is something you deal with. You are a small business owner. Nobody ever gets a bill for repairing their car that they think is the right amount or, or not mm -hmm. twice as or three times as much as they want. And you didn't get drawn into culture wars. Tell me how you, you skirted these issues. Uh, just talking about what matters to people. I think we are all really tired of the political agenda being set by Twitter. You know, we want good schools. We want, a, a, we want to have the cops show up when we call them. You know, I've had my building broken into four times this year. I mean, that gets expensive. And we can't afford to keep going down this road of polarization because... Well, you know, our, our kids need an America that has a level playing field for small businesses, for public schools, uh, for home ownership. All of that stuff deeply matters for the long term economic health and the health of our democracy. So tell me about the, these issues now, because you are not going to be part of the majority, but you come there with a, a deep understanding of these issues. Inflation and the economy continue to be the top issue for people. You deal with both of them, right? You deal with the fact that we have low unemployment, we've got rising wages, we have inflation. It's part of the reason people repair cars uh, that otherwise they'd get rid of or do something else. What do you want to see done so that you've got a, you stand a stronger chance and, the, and, and Democrats stand a stronger chance uh, versus Republicans in the House in 2024? Well, I am here to, um, to be an advocate for middle America, and I think one of the, the bleeding edge of that is something known as right to repair laws, laws that give consumers and, and independent manufacturers, you know, uh, shops like mine, um, people that own iPhones, uh, home medical equipment, the, the ability to fix their own stuff, that give people who work in the trades an ability to have a level playing field, um, to avoid consumer waste. 
um, electronic waste, those are all critical issues when we look at the long-term economic health. Um, and, and part and parcel of that is ensuring that we support career and technical education. I'm part of the generation where our best trade schools all got turned into computer programming schools. I don't know how many computer programmers you hired last week, but I bet many people watching this are on a wait list for an electrician, a carpenter, yep. a plumber. And those are jobs that can't be exported. They, they, they can't be offshored. We've got to do the work that it takes in the long term to bring back the trades in America. So do you think you can, you can get these discussions prioritized in this polarized world where decisions are made on Twitter and things are culture wars and we have conspiracy <laughs> theorists all around us? Because everything you're saying should be music to sort of every American's ears, regardless of where they are on the political spectrum, right? These, these literally are the things that are going to solve, solve our economic problems. Do you do you know enough about the process to think that you can prioritize these things uh, in your caucus? Yeah, I mean, listen, I didn't run for Congress assuming I would be in the majority. I mean, I, I was clear-eyed coming into this that it takes bipartisanship to be effective in Congress, and it ought to. So I think the sort of binary thinking of, like, are they R's or D's in control? We've got to walk away from that. We've got to walk away from being cheerleaders for our party and start being advocates for our district. And, and that's why I'm here, and that's why people sent me and not a better-funded uh, candidate to Congress. So it's about finding people that, um, you know, are working in swing districts that are there to show up to do the hard work and not stand behind, you know, party leadership. What happens when Republicans get the message that, that came through from your election and don't put a Joe Kent up, put a Jamie Herrera Butler up? Are you confident you would have won that race? Well, I did not get in this race to be Jamie Herrera Butler. I will tell you that much. Um, but I, I, my, you know, my real hope in, in running this race is that it's not about me as an individual candidate, but it's a clear message to both parties, frankly, to stop going out and finding candidates that can self-fund and go out and find candidates mm. who work for a living, who work in the trades, who have grease under their fingernails, who worry about making their mortgage payments, who, you know, aren't out buying new cars all the time people that really want to fix stuff. And it's going to take grassroots work from both political parties uh, to do that work. I, I want to ask you one thing. You, 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 don't, you, you use Twitter very judiciously. You're not sort of looking for uh, retweets and Twitter fame. But you did tweet that rural Democrats are almost an endangered species now. And I think we need mm -hmm. to take a real hard look at why that is. What do you mean and, and, and how do you fix that? Well, you know, specifically where I live, we've had a lot of um, timber issues, I think, that have alienated Democrats in rural communities. You know, I'm um, a fifth generation, I've come from five generations of loggers in Washington state. Um, and I, 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 my sense is that so many Democrats come into rural communities with postgraduate degrees and they try to explain stuff to us. And that gets really old really quick because in rural communities we know stuff that um, those folks don't and and I think it takes listening and not assuming you know how to fix our problems with what without understanding what the real problems are like I actually get my internet from a radio tower I'm pretty sure I'm going to be the only member of Congress who doesn't have broadband internet at home and so I'm really tired of having people try to fix my problems without listening to me about what my problems really are Congresswoman-elect, thank you uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you for telling us about yeah. your road to victory. The Congresswoman-elect from Washington's 3rd Congressional District, Marie Glusenkamp-Perez, thanks for making time for us tonight. Thank you.